This is a demo for the Canon C100 Mark II. Let's have a look and see what we get in the port brace rucksack. Okay, so we got this nice little menu here. This will list all the items. When you get the kit from the store, if you don't have everything that is on this menu, you need to have a chat with Ollie or Trisha at the store. Okay. In this section here, we keep two large high capacity batteries and two 64 gig SD cards. This side, we have got the camera itself with its grip handle. In here, we have got a 2470 Canon zoom. It's an L series lens and it's f2.8. That's throughout the range. Here we've got the top handle for if we want to record our sound properly. Okay. And here we have got our battery charger, main supply. Let's get everything out so you can see it clearly. So there's everything that you would get in the bag. Just to recap for you, two batteries, two SD cards, top handle, camera with its grip, Canon 2470 zoom lens, battery charger, main supply for the camera. So here's the Canon C100 Mark II on the Manfrotto 504 tripod, which is our recommended tripod for a camera of this size. Hopefully, when you get your camera, you will have a side grip here, but this camera hasn't got one because it might have been taken off because the camera's been on a stabilizer or rig of some kind. So we're going to put the pistol grip on. Okay. Here's our pistol grip. Notice we've got the jack connector here, which connects it electronically. This is going to need to go into this section here. So let's just put this in. Okay. Then so you can see it, I am going to just place this and orientate it. I could do it like this or like this, whatever I want, but I'm going to put this just sort of upright. That's in place. And then I'm just going to screw this gently down. Just finger tight. Let's bring this around here so we can see. Now we need to put a lens on. To get the body cap off, we press the little button, undo that, comes out. Thank you. Okay. We're going to align the red button on the lens to the red button on the body. Clicks into place. Lovely. Okay, next we now need to put the battery in. So let's spin this around. Okay, so great. Thank you very much. So for the battery, we make sure that our contacts are on this side of the camera and we just basically push it in. Then we can check the level by just pressing this little button here get our green light so we know that we're fully charged. When we want to take the battery out, we press the battery release and it comes out. Now we need to put our SD card in. We've got our two slots, A and B here. Let's start it in A. Card goes contacts down. Push that in. Now, don't forget to pull this little door down, or otherwise you won't be able to record. You'll get a command that says invalid operation. Okay, so make sure that is down. To turn the camera on, we flick up here to the camera setting. Next to there, there's a lock icon. If we flick the camera up to there, 
The camera will be on, but it will be locked in whatever state you left it. So it means that nobody can come up and fiddle and change any of the settings, but also they actually won't be able to press record either. So for the most part, you're going to be on camera. If you need to actually look back at your footage, you have to go through off and then go down to media. And then at the back of the camera, which we'll show you later, we'll show you how to review your shots. Put the camera back to off. I'd like to point out here, we have got a strap mount. Here we could attach a strap, which could then go over to the pistol grip. There is one in the bag if you want to hang the camera around your neck. And here we've also got a little hook here that this corresponds with the focus plane icon. If you did have a tape measure in your bag and you wanted to measure out from the camera to a subject's eyes, you would actually attach the strap to that. But you might not need to do that nowadays. Looking at the camera from front to back, the lens, we have got our focus ring here. We have then got our autofocus or manual focus on the lens. We have then got our zoom from the 24, which is the wide end, to the 70, which is the long end. Okay. Now down here, we have got the one shot autofocus. This is really handy if you've got the camera, if you've got the lens on the autofocus mode is that if you're in a rush or you're doing documentary style work, you can literally just press this button and it'll focus just once for you. It's not going to keep hunting or searching, but it'll focus just once for you. It's very good if you move the camera to a position and you're going to hold it. Okay. Next to that, we've got the ND filter ring. ND is neutral density filter. and We can rack these up and down. It's a nice manual physical stop and we can see what we're doing in the viewfinder will actually let us know. For those of you who need reminding, the ND filter is like a set of sunglasses, but it's internal, it's actually in the camera. And it means that we can reduce the amount of light coming in, but still shoot wide open if that's what you want to do. Okay. Next to that, we've got the push auto iris. Again, another very handy button is if you're rushing around, again, documentary style, this will set the exposure to what the camera thinks is best. It's not perfect for every situation, but for general shooting, again, if you're in a rush, it's a good, safe way of setting your exposure. Next to there, we have got the ISO gain. The ISO is our amplification of the signal. So for example, when we're shooting cinema, we'll be on 850 ISO. Next to here, we have got our shutter button. Again, by pressing this button, we will see in the viewfinder uh, our, our exposure options with the shutter. Uh, also in the menu, if we want to, we can either use shutter angle or actual uh, a shutter number. Working up, we have got autofocus lock. Again, if we are working with a camera with autofocus, we can set a focus and then we can press onto that and that will keep it locked up. Here we've got these buttons are all assignable because they have numbers, but the way they set out are pretty useful, so I'd leave them as they are. We've got our zebra button, which will turn our zebras on and off. That's an exposure aid. We've got peaking, our focus aid. We've got magnification, which is another helpful button. There's also another magnification by the pistol grip by the fire button on the other side, which is very useful. Status lets us know wherever we are at any one point on some of our settings. Then coming down here, we have got our white balance button, but also we have got our preset button, which we can go in and out of as well if we want to set a white balance with a white or a grey card. Uh, down here, we've got the exhaust vent. Uh, there's nothing that you should really do with this, but the main thing is, is don't ever cover this up with any tape or anything because your camera will overheat. Last button at the bottom is the custom picture button. This is where we can select our picture profile. So we could use cinema, which is number nine, wide DR, which is not quite as flat, which is number eight, or we can use Canon standard, which is number seven, which is very good if you have absolutely no time to do any grading. Um, that's everything for this side of the camera. So if you're going to spin the camera around, let's have a look at the back. On the LED screen, we have got the menu button here. Then using this little joystick, we can toggle up and down, right and left. We can go in 
and we can get around the menu. If we want to go back just one stage, we can use cancel. If we want to clear it, we press the menu there. Here we've got the display button. This clears our display for us. If we want to go for a take, we might not want all this information up because we want to concentrate on focus and composition. And again, we can bring it back just by pressing the button there. Okay. So moving to the right-hand side of the back of the camera, we have got here, these are the play controls. Remember, these are only going to work when we actually set the on-off button down to media. Okay. So we have got our usual, it's like an old deck. We've got our uh, go, rewind, fast forward, start, stop, go to the start of the scene, go to the end, okay? And then moving down here, we've got slot select. So we can choose which card we're using if we've got two cards in like we have here. We've then got our index button and then we've got our waveform monitor. So if Mark pans back over to the left hand side, we can see we can have our waveform choice, or we've got our vector scope, or we have got a parade down the bottom here. So let's just leave this on the waveform. Okay. Now, if we have a look at all of our connection points here, we have got our headphone socket, we've got our remote control there. Coming out of here, we've got a USB for downloading footage. Then we've got a HDMI out if we want to go to an uh, external recorder like an Atomos, or if we just want to play out to a widescreen monitor. And then below, we have got our DC in. That is our mains power supply, if we're lucky enough to be by a 13 amp socket when we're shooting. OK, so. Mark can just pan over to the grip here. We're just going to have a look at this button here. This is our magnification button. This is lovely. If I press this in, that way we can zoom in for focusing. OK. Then we again, we have got our remote toggle, which we can use again for the menu if we want to. It's a secondary button. And then at the top, we have a start stop button here and we've got our iris control here. Fire button here. And in these flaps, we've got our external control. This is when we put our top handle on. We need to connect the plug to there. And then we have got a mic. That's just for a little standard jack. You could put a little Rode mic in the hot shoe here if you didn't want to use the top handle. Though to remind you, this camera does actually have a very, very basic internal mic, which you can use for scratch recordings just to get your slates in sync. There's also another vent on this side of the camera to be aware of as well. At the top of the camera, we've got the viewfinder. Now, this is where the C100 Mark II is way better than the C100 Mark I, where the viewfinder was terrible and everybody knew it was terrible even Canon knew it was terrible but now we've got a really nice viewfinder now the reason you might want to use this rather than using the LED screen is you could be outside it could be a very bright day and you really need to get the daylight out so short of throwing a black shroud over yourself this is the next best thing so we can uh, look through here if it's looking a bit out of focus it's quite possible that somebody has changed the diopter slider here this is if you wear glasses. So it means you can, in theory, take your glasses off if you're short-sighted and you can have a clear image. If you've got an astigmatism, you're stuck. You need to keep your glasses back on. Okay. Underneath here, we've got a viewfinder button. You can actually turn the viewfinder on and off. This is handy if you want to save a little bit of power. On the right-hand side, we've got a little loudspeaker. This will play back your shots so when you're in the media section you can play back your shots and you can actually hear if you've got something it's not going to sound very good but at least you know that you've got some recordings to record decent sound on the canon we need to mount this top handle top handle connects with a cold shoe here we've got a cold shoe setting on the camera difference between a cold and a hot shoe is a hot shoe has got electrical connections 
coal shoes purely for mounting purposes and it has got this screw thread here which will secure it in. So I'm going to slide this in from the front like this, do this up here, turn this in. Then we've got the external connection. This takes the place of any information that would come from a hot shoe and what's important here is we've got a little white arrow there which connects up to our little white arrow here. Okay, so we have to push this in quite firmly, making sure the arrows are fully lined up, presses in with a click. That's not going anywhere. If you want to actually take it out, you have to actually pull the silver collar that is by the connection point, pull that back first, then we can get it out. Okay, let's pop it back in for the rest of the day. Okay. That's in, lovely. To record sound with the Canon, we've got a few options. Without the uh, top handle, we can use this little microphone here. This is a mono microphone and we can't control the level, so it's on auto, but it's really useful for just getting your slates as getting just a guide track. Once the handle's on, moving up, we can use our left and right stereo mic in the handle. We can set the levels on this, so that's quite accurate. Uh, but it's not particularly directional. What we can do is we can fit a separate shotgun or directional mic in here and then this will then get us more focused sound. Now with that microphone we could then connect this up into these XLRs but it's most likely for anything you'll be shooting you'll be using microphones on a boom or radio mics and either way they're going to be going into this XLR settings here. So if we go around to the other side I can show you the controls on how to set the sound levels. We have our control wheels at the top so we can set our levels for channel 1 and channel 2. Then we can choose to be in manual control which is what makes the uh, dial work or we could be in auto like that, auto like that. But really we're going to be on manual aren't we? Then we have got our mic choice. We want to be mic and 48, which is phantom power, because it's most likely the mic we're using is being powered from the battery from the camera. And then these switches are handy. We can go internal or external. That means if we're using internal, we're actually using these stereo mics from here. So whatever we've got plugged in from a boom actually isn't going to work. So we have to be on the external setting to make those work. But what it does mean is that we could uh, have one microphone which could be from Boom on channel one, and then if we wanted to just get some basic Atmos from somewhere else, we could have channel two on the internal mic, and then you can split up the sound in Premiere or your editing system later on. Okay, when we're all set, let's close the flap. We don't have any little fingers fiddling with that. And then other things to point out on the top, we've got yet another fire button here. I think that's the third one that we've got going. And we've also got a quarter inch jack which we can use to plug in an Atomos recorder or a um, radio mic if it's got a, a connection piece like that. If we want to fit a shotgun mic into the holder on top of the handle, we'll undo this screw here, open this out. The mic might need a little bit of packing because they invariably don't fit. So a little bit of foam rubber will do screw this in. Okay. Now this is particularly useful if maybe if you're on your own and you don't have anybody to hold a boom for you and you don't have a radio mic on you at least you can get a directional sound which would be quite good for a simple interview or just if you are just dashing around and getting shots. This is our typical display of the LED. It looks pretty busy, but I'll just go around what everything is. Starting at the top, we have got our battery. Everything's looking good there. We've also got our memory card slots, A and B. Two cards in there, 64 gig each. Loads of time there. We could shoot all week on that. Then coming down here, that says 25 mil. That is actually telling us what the focal length of the lens is. If I spin this around here, I can go to the other end, I can go to 70, and I can go to 25. It's just a handy way of knowing what that is. Coming down here, we are on manual focus, okay? I can click the lens onto 
autofocus, he says AF there. Put that back to manual. Okay, coming down here, ND1, two stops. It's looking a little bit dark. That means I've got my sunglasses on. Let's open this up. Wrong way. Okay, no ND there. You see, if I put it back, it'll tell me. Going down a bit further, CP9. This is our cinema log setting, okay? If I had set this in cinema locked, it would say locked, but I showed you that. Coming down here, we have then got the Kelvin display. So I go again. Coming down, we have got K for Kelvin. If I just change this on the... Uh, coming down here, we have got K for Kelvin. If I just change the white balance, I can then change that to auto or my uh, tungsten or outside, okay? Further down here, we have got the iris, that's 2.8, that's wide open on this lens. Then we've got the ISO, that is the sort of sensitivity of the camera or the gain, but ISO, and that's 850 at the moment. It's in brackets because this is the base exposure of the camera and it's what's recommended that this camera works best at, certainly for the cinema log. Then we've got our shutter, which is at 180 degrees. Moving over to the right hand side, we've got our audio meters. These are just currently working off the internal microphones. Uh, and this tells us we've got channel one and channel two are both working. Next, we can bring up our waveform monitor. So if I bring this up, we've got our histogram here and our vector scope. Okay, and then we've got like a parade at the bottom. Uh, at the top, standby, recording. 25p, 1920 by 1080, which is HD, 24 megabits per second, and our current time code, which you see will alter as we record. Just to make sure that our audio channel selection is correct, we go menu, let's go to, we're in audio already, and then we can choose XLR record channel, channel one, or we can choose channel one, channel two. This is common if you've only got one XLR coming in, but you want it to go onto both tracks because it will save you a little time in editing later on, duplicating the sound. Or we could just go to channel one if we wanted to. But again, this is a control that we can actually do on the handle. But let's go to one and two. So before we start shooting, we need to initialize the media or format the card. So let's press the menu button. Okay, then let's bring us all the way down to the spanner, probably the settings button here. And we're going to need to go over here and we're going to navigate all the way down. It's quite some way down here to initialize media. Let's press that in. Let's do it in card A. Press that in. Let's go to quick. Will arrays, initialize, yes, okay. Initializing. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and we just press cancel to get out of there. Next, let's set the system frequency. So we get our menu, and again, we're gonna go back down to the spanner setting. Gonna go across from there, down to System frequency, okay, press this in. We have a choice of 50 hertz or 59. Basically, that is Europe, that is America. The only real reason you're going to want to go to 59 is that it means that you could record at 24 frames per second, which is very specific if you think you are going to get a cinema release. For most of the work I think you will be doing whilst at university, I would keep us to 50 hertz and then that way we can record at 25 FPS. Next, let's choose the movie format. So, menu, let's come down to the spanner, come down here, got two choices, movie format, AVC HD or MP4. Whatever we choose, we have to come down to the next tab to do it. 
So let's go back to MP4, choose AVCHD. Now we can come down to the AVCHD tab, then we can get into the details. Okay, so on both MP4 AVCHD, the highest bit rate we can choose at 25 frames per second. Normal recording is 24 megabits per second. Here we've got the choice of LPCM or not. LPCM gives us the least compressed audio, it's the best audio possible that we can record to the card with the picture. Okay, if I did reselect and go up to 28 megabits per second, this just gives us the opportunity to shoot off speed. That's 50p, 50 frames per second. But you could slow that down in Premiere and have some decent slow motion. Okay, let's go back to 24 megabits per second, 50i or 25p. Let's say we actually want to come up and do this in MP4. We have to go back, change the movie format to MP4. Now we can make an adjustment in the MP4 tab. Press that in and we can choose here 35 megabits per second. So if you want to get the highest possible off speed or high speed recording, you really want to use MP4 because then you've got 35 megabits per second, okay? Press that in. You can see that's grayed out. 50p, that's all we can shoot with that. We can't shoot 25p on that, we can only shoot 50p, okay? The audio is ever so slightly compressed, but you're gonna be, have to be cleverer than me to actually notice that. Okay, let's pop that back down to 24 megabits per second. That reboots, now we can get to 25p. Okay, that's how we set our movie format. To set the picture profile, we hit the picture profile button on the side of the camera. Okay, then that brings up this menu here, set. We're gonna use the joystick, press that in. We're going to select camera, press in again. Then we have got the choice of C9, that's our cinema, that's our flat log. This is what we use if we intend on doing color grading. It will give us in theory some more dynamic range and it gives us a softer, better image but we could change that to wide DR, which is a little bit different, I wouldn't recommend that. Or you can go EOS standard. If you've got no time to grade anything, but as long as you can shoot it properly, EOS standard looks pretty good, but otherwise we should really all be on cinema. So select that, come out of that, and we're ready to go. Can you see here? CP9, that's where we're set. Now, where we can get a little bit stuck on this is there's another way to approach this. There's another way to put the cinema setting on actually in the camera menu. So if I bring the menu up, okay, and you see I was already on this, but if I come down to there, you've got cinema locked. Now that is off at the moment. If I press that in and go on and then come out of this on the menu, it says CP locked. Now, even though that doesn't say nine, that is nine and it's locked. And it means if I press the custom picture button again, absolutely nothing will happen. So that's fine if you want to shoot on cinema, but if you want to get rid of it and you want to shoot on EOS standard, you think I can't get rid of this. The only way to do it is to go back into menu and then in the camera setting, not the normal settings, we've got the camera icon here, we go to cinema locked, press that in, turn that off, okay? Now we're back to CP9, and if I wanted to, I could go to custom picture, and I could select that, go to the camera, and then choose what I want. Okay, let's go back to cinema. To adjust the ISO, we press the ISO button on the side of the camera, and then by using our toggle switch, we can go up or down. So we can go low ISO, minimum of 320, 400, 800, 850, whatever. Now, a few things to point out about the ISO on this particular camera. Can you see that when we get to 850, it's got brackets behind it? This is the native ISO of the camera. This is where this camera certainly performs best when it's in the cinema mode. 
it's where you get the widest dynamic range and that's why it's in brackets. So I would recommend that you shoot at that ISO setting of 850. Even if you think that you could get a bit lower because you've got a bit too much light, let's press this again, you're kind of better being at 850 and if you've got too much light use your ND wheels and then reduce your light that way. You see? You can do that. One of the small problems with shooting with any log setting is that what you see on the viewfinder often looks a bit mushy and it's quite low contrast. So there's a way that you can actually uh, adjust this with your viewfinder to help you out. So if we go to menu, this time we're going to go all the way down to the OLED, the OLED viewfinder setup. And I'm going to click over here and go to view assist. If I click this to on, watch how the image brightens up a little bit. See? It's not much here, but that will help you out. It negates the softening effect of shooting on log setting. Uh, two of the other buttons that we can use on the side of the camera are the peaking and the zebra buttons. On the side of the camera, so we press peaking, and you can see that tells us that we've got peaking on there peaking which is our focus aid. Can you see that little red on my ring there? That means that's sharp and if I press peaking again then it's gone. Okay, then we have zebras as well, I can turn that on and again that's set at 70 percent so that kind of works if you just get the highlights on the skin tone that works well for 70. If that wasn't on, let's say I'll turn this off on the side here, we would go into the menu and then we would go back up to the OLED viewfinder and we'd come down, we go peaking and we can turn that on or off, okay? And we can choose what setting we want. We can go to zebras and again on or off, on, and then we can choose our level, what we want. I tend to go for 70 for the skin turns, okay? Press the white balance button on the side. So then this icon comes up. Here we have it on daylight, little sun. We can go to tungsten. We could do it numerically. If I now click to the right, I can do this this way. I can go manual, so I could go from all the way down to 3200 if I wanted to make that um, studio. Okay, I can go back all the way to 5.6 if I want to take this to outside, okay? or any extreme further on from there. Okay, when I'm set, let's go back to 5, 6. Okay. To adjust our shutter speed, we press our shutter button on the side of the camera. At the moment, we're at 1 50th of a second. If I want to adjust this, I can go to 40, 33, and that lets more light in or we can go to 60, 75, 90th, whatever. Now really, we always want to be shooting on 50th of a second to get that film look. Uh, certainly if you want to go higher, you will get a much sort of kind of more defined image. There will be less motion blur. But the film look generally is 1 50th of a second. Now there's the other way of doing this, which is the more professional way, but we can't set it in here. So we are going to come to the camera menu here and we're going to go down to shutter and instead of being on speed we're going to be on angle and then now if I have a look at this my angle is 180 degrees so if I press my shutter again here I can still change that okay I could go to 240th which is lets more light in or I could go to all the way down to 90, and that's the equivalent of a hundredth of a second. So you can do this. The good thing about keeping your shutter set to 180 
is that if you do decide to go off speed at 50 frames per second, your film look will always be intact. You don't have to do a sum or a calculation. There's a couple of good auto functions on here. So let's start off with push auto iris. If I just press this in, this will then just bring the exposure up to an average. I mean, this is going to work fine because this is sort of a grey room. It wouldn't work so well if you had somebody in a black room under a bright spotlight, but for a lot of situations, it'll work quite well. Also, we've got at the front of the camera, we have got the one shot autofocus. Now, the lens has got to be set on autofocus for this to work. Again, that's sharp. That's quite a handy thing. Now, obviously, if I move the camera around, it's not going to work. We need to get actually into the camera menu to have full autofocus. Let's have a look at that. So, go menu. Go in the camera, we're in autofocus setting, then we get to one shot. Let's go to continuous. Okay, let's come out of there. Right, so if I put my hand in, it's going to focus on there. It's going to focus on the background. It's going to focus on what is within the rectangle in the middle. Now, I wouldn't recommend making a film like this because every time you move the camera, something is going to happen. Also, you can actually hear as well that the uh, lens servo is working and your audio might be picking this up if you're coming from the top of the camera. But again, it's just a way of ensuring you've got some kind of focus if you're not there or you're in a situation where you really just have not got time to get it. Apart from ISO and shutter, our other exposure variables are the iris control, on the right hand side here, can you see these numbers changing? I'm wide open at 2.8 as I move the wheel and the exposure comes down and goes darker and darker and darker to 22. That's the limit of this lens. It's not closed, it's just not letting a lot of light in at all. Open this back up to 2.8. Let's say for whatever reason that was still too bright, it's a very bright day, I can operate the ND filter and if I move this See? Six stops. That's hardly anything coming through there. Four stops. Two stops. OK? So if this bright outside, that way we can put the ND on. It's like having a pair of sunglasses but within the camera. And we could still shoot at quite a wide aperture at 2.8. That way we could still achieve a very shallow depth of field even on a very bright day. And we can still keep our shutter speed at a 50th of a second or a shutter angle of 180 degrees.